Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for coming to How Local News Can Empower Civic Engagement in the Fight Against Misinformation. My name is Anita Lee. I am the founder and editor-in-chief of a hyper-local independent news outlet uh, called The Green Line, which is all about investigating the way we live to help young Torontonians survive and thrive in a rapidly changing city. I'm also a longtime media consultant and journalist based in Toronto, Canada, as well as uh, instructor at the City University of New York, Ryerson University and Centennial College in Toronto. I'm here with my esteemed panelists. To my right is Tassos Morphis, who is the co-founder of Project Epsilon, which is an Athens-based startup that's developing an engagement management system for local and niche digital newsrooms to build meaningful relationships with their audiences. Uh, he is also the co-founder of Athens Live, a local news publication based in Athens, Greece, which he'll be telling you more about today. To my left is Candace Fortman, who is the executive director of Outlier Media, uh, which is a Detroit-based service journalism organization that identifies, reports, and delivers valuable information to empower residents to hold landlords, municipal government, and elected officials accountable for long-standing problems. And finally, to my far left is Mariana Bruschi, uh, the ed digital editor for La Stampa and an engaged journalism accelerator ambassador. Uh, La Stampa is the sixth biggest Italian newspaper by circulation and the third biggest by digital audience. In recent years, it's strengthened community involvement through membership plans, newsletters, editorial services uh, built from the bottom up. So effectively, you're hearing about local news from Greece, uh, from a Greek, Canadian, American, and Italian perspective. And we came together because we noticed that the way we're engaging communities and our audiences and the services we're offering are actually quite aligned and there's a lot of overlap. We're tackling a lot of the shame, shared problems about, uh, you know, uh, serving underserved communities as well as tackling misinformation. And what we'd like to do actually is you'll find that there was a sheet in the seats with a QR code. We'd love if you could actually scan that QR code. And what it will take you to is a, an audience survey because we're hoping to build a network of local news organizations around the world. Um, there's also a word cloud that I'd love, uh, I'm gonna share right before my presentation that I'd love for you to participate in. Uh, the question that we're asking is, what is one word that defines local journalism in your geographic area? So the word really effectively, we want you to just contrib contribute one word that really defines local journalism in your region. This paper. I think I can change place and okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can change place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Oh, okay. Well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we can start now. <laughs> so, definitions. <laughs> what is a local newspaper? For me, it's a sort of cultural mediator um, between citizens and institutions. And it, it gives a voice to citizens. Um, it has a history um, that often in Italy it goes back centuries. And I think it is also a physical place where citizens can go. And it is my, made by people who take their children <laughs> to the schools they, they write about, uh, or they need hospital they write about, and so on. And 
I think that, that there is a great possibility of dialogue. Uh, and for me, dialogue is the first step uh, to increase uh, uh, trust. And so how we are working. In, in JEDI Group, we have two national titles, La Repubblica and La Stampa, uh, with local edition for both. And then we have 10 local newspaper, uh, regional newspaper, or also very, very local. For example, La Sentinella cover only one city, that is Ivrea. And for our local titles, uh, we have a membership uh, project. And membership program for us has three keywords, engagement, meet your audience, and trust. And uh, we know that those who are more active in their community are also um, likely to pay for local news, and we need them. And we have learned that we um, have to start to speak about relationship with our readers, and this is so different from, from a traditional marketing funnel. And we also know now that Meet Your Audience uh, is also in content, because not always uh, our journalism is uh, what reader, uh, readers want. And then trust. I think we have to increase trust uh, and to <laughs> cover the free circles. So when I speak about uh, meet your audience, I think uh, also to live events. And there is a before COVID with a lot of community events. And now during COVID, we have online events. And for us, meeting people is also our way to fight misinformation, disinformation, because we are trying to explain our job and how, for example, we find news and verify news and so on. But I think the more important meetings are with students. We bring them in our newsroom, even if now it's uh, only with Zoom call. And we start with them uh, a, a process towards a sane path of information. Um, engagement for our newsroom is uh, also try to involve people in our investigative reporting. This is an example about broadband gap. We compared uh, an official data set to uh, a data set made by readers with uh, the speed test. And then we have repeated it uh, uh, in other titles, uh, uh, also in La Stampa, so from local to, to national. And we use also a DNI project, Come Together, to give newsroom an uh, easy tool to increase uh, this kind of project. And I think that this kind of project can help us to improve trust. Uh, this is an example from uh, Il Tirreno. We start with the question, how many days or weeks you need to book an exam in hospital, in public hospital in Tuscany, a lot. Um, also in this, in this project, we um, use a, an official data set, and then we have asked readers to, to share their experience. And we collect a lot of stories, and then after um, a month, uh, the healthcare institution apologizes with, uh, with the readers via the newspaper. So, to go straight to the end, <laughs> four tips we have learned with, uh, with our um, membership program. The first is that we can consider the local newspaper as a glue uh, for our uh, reader community that often are already solid, but I think they need a, a glue, they need us. And then we have changed our matrix. When we have introduced a new, new matrix, and I think that is uh, that people come back to, to the center. And then the sad tip, <laughs> in our newsroom, we need to do more with the same number of people or with less people. And the last, we must listen again because uh, we, we need to uh, give citizens a voice. So, thank you. So next we have Candace Fortman.
All righty. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Candace Fortman, and I'm the executive director of Outlier Media. Outlier is a startup journalism organization in Detroit, Michigan, United States. And Outlier was founded by Sarah Alvarez when she was doing a fellowship at JSK at Stanford. And what she was trying to figure out is how do you inform residents of Detroit who have been either intentionally under-informed by traditional models of journalism or, un, um, or, or uninformed because they do not have access to the same digital um, elements. Like for instance, they might not have Wi-Fi in their homes, which means that reading a digital newspaper might be difficult. So how do you reach those folks? And I think more important what she was trying to answer is how do you find out what it is that they need to know in order to survive living in the city? So we really look at misinformation and disinformation a little bit different because in every community, and I'm sure you all understand this, mis and disinformation means something different. Um, it might mean one thing if you're in one area, but if you're in Detroit, it might mean that you're being scammed, for instance, through a, um, someone who's doing nefarious housing policy. And so that means we need to understand what is it that Detroiters don't need to know, so we're gonna talk about how we get there. Our mission is this, by keeping residents first, we hope to give more than we take and to leave people with the information they need to create change in their own communities. In order to fulfill that mission, we need to understand what it is that they don't know so that we can create actionable information they can use to make change in their own lives. Sarah has often said information gaps are where accountability and transparency go to die. So when you have a community that does not have good information around, for instance, transportation, that means that there are a lot of actors that can be act really poorly in that area because the residents don't have the information they need in order to make good decisions for themselves. Like this clicker, for instance. I don't, yeah, that's an uh, information gap for me, evidently. Um, so when I think about our why for why we do our journalism, this would be it. If journalism serves those with the highest and most difficult to fill information gaps or needs, it can serve all, um, it can serve all. Also, I can't see that. <laughs> if journalism is civic infrastructure and a high functioning, or journalism should be civic infrastructure and a high functioning community. And what I mean by that is that when there are good information systems in a community, that community thrives. There's a great report that came out that talked about when, uh, it was not a great report, it was actually a very sad report, but when a community lost its newspaper, it also decreased its bond rating. It also saw higher rates of um, political um, misdeeds, right? Because there was nobody there to cover that. When you think about journalism, you should be thinking about something as, as essential as water in a community, as essential as being able to turn on the lights in a community. Journalism is as much a part as of the civic, it should be as much a part of the civic infrastructure of a community if we want to live in high functioning communities. And then collaboration is the future of journalism. And finally, we can build newsrooms that value the lives of the people it serves and the people employed there within. So we first start by doing an information needs assessment. We do this every six months. We text a random group of Detroiters and ask them, if you had a journalist working with you over the next week, what would you have them find out for you? We also look at public record information, like non-emergency 911 calls. We also look at calls that have come into United Way, which is a social service agency in the United States. What are people calling to ask questions about? What are they calling to complain about? That is where you find out where people have information gaps. We also look at a number of other data sets and work with data reporters to crunch those numbers to find out what our beats of reporting will be from there. That means that our beats of reporting change sometimes every six months as information needs in Detroit change. We watched that happen a lot during COVID. So in the beginning of COVID, there were a lot of, all of a sudden food in Detroit emerged as an information need for the first time ever because so many people were unemployed. By the time we got to a year out from COVID, the number one information need in Detroit was around transportation. Because as people were starting to go back to work and as bus drivers were increasingly not working because they were sick, the bus routes were, some people were waiting four hours to catch a bus to get to their job. We found that out because people were telling us that directly through that SMS news service. So once we have the information gaps established, we run a direct-to-consumer text messaging service where Detroiters can text us 
24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And in that, you see where those high information gap is, um, information reporting is. So you text one for housing problems. Housing is always, unfortunately, is always number one on our, um, uh, in our information gaps assessment. Also, electricity and water issues. And then number three is always there because sometimes people's problem is not any of those things. It's something else that we don't know anything about. So they can cho choose number three and ask to speak directly to a reporter. And within 48 hours, a reporter from our newsroom follows up directly with that person to answer that question for them. A lot of times people are asking questions that they actually know the answer to. But imagine this, you have an incredibly high cognitive load you're in crisis in that moment, and sometimes all you need is somebody to affirm that you're calling the right number at the city, that you're filling out the right form, that you're doing the thing that you need to do in order to move yourself out of crisis. That service is available in Spanish, um, um, English, and Arabic, because those are the three languages most spoken in the Metro Detroit area. All of the information in this system was reported by journalists in our newsroom. A lot of it is about data scraping, so we work with a lot of data reporters to scrape city sites and, and county sites to make sure that Detroiters can access sometimes these very hard to reach systems. So this is sort of what it looks like um, when someone wants to speak directly to a reporter in our newsroom. So you'll see here that Miriam is following up with somebody with the issue they're having. They're about to lose their house to the tax foreclosure auction in the city of Detroit. And she's helping them get information so that they can file a grievance to save their home from foreclosure. I believe in one of these cases, the person was literally within days of losing their house. So this is a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And I think you can see in here, the woman says to her, thank you so much um, for your time and concern, as well as going the extra mile, getting me the assistance um, in my time of need. And what happens when we think about building trust, so somebody uses the service, for instance, and it works for them, right? They get the information they need, and so they talk to a friend of theirs, and they're like, oh, well, I had that problem, and I used this service, and I think you should use it too. And a lot, of our, um, a lot of our audience is being built in that way, where people actually use the service, it works for them, and so they tell other folks to use it. We also do a lot of our sourcing um, for our long-form and investigative reporting out of that SMS service. So this story in particular, which we did in collaboration with NBC News, was sourced directly from the SMS service. We started getting all of these text messages about people who had purchased, a, that were um, purchasing a home on a land grant from an owner of the house, right? So that person said, you'll pay me rent for let's say two years. At the end of that two years, you will own the house free and clear and I'll give you the deed to the house. The person gets to the end of that two years, they give them that last payment, they call and say, okay, it's my house, I'll come and collect the deed, and that person disappears. What is most often true is they never owned the house in the first place because Detroit has a very interesting market where a lot of people own houses that live outside of, of Detroit, many of them outside of the state and, and increasingly outside of the country. So they're not aware that someone is living in a house and it allows for people who are scammers to be able to create fake deeds and fake documents to trick people into paying them two, three years worth of rent. And then when those people get to the end, they lose those houses. This story in particular, this woman was um, a former, um, she had a, 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 a um, uh, had had a very difficult life and had worked really hard to clean up her life, to get a job, to get back on her feet. She buys this, she thinks she's buying this house. She not only thinks she's buying the house, but at this point the house had been completely gutted. So she actually did all of the work to rehab the house herself. She bought every piece of material. She got to the end two years later and the people completely disappeared on her. Come to find out the person who actually owned the house lived in California and had no clue anybody was even in the house. The, um, the, the case is currently going through courts right now, so we are not sure what's going to happen. What we do know is she will be fine because a number of people have donated money to a fund to, to help her, but it's not just about the one individual. It's about a bad system. It's about a broken system, and so what I'm most proud of is that our attorney general actually opened up an investigation into this and is building a new system so that we have a better renter registry in the city that allows them to account for who owns the houses that people are moving into. And then the last thing we have is Detroit documenters. I hope that some of you, many of you, um, have grown to know the organization City Bureau in Chicago in the States. 
City Bureau developed an, um, a, a, a program called Documenters where they train and pay residents to go to public meetings and to report, no, to take notes at those public meetings. City Council meetings, board, uh, water board meetings, um, board of education meetings, all the meetings that you have in a local community. Those residents then take notes. The notes are edited by reporters and editors across the city and made accessible over a, a public uh, website for anybody to use, whether it be community groups or other journalists who are trying to do reporting. This is really important because as you know, our newsrooms are getting smaller. There was not a single person working in Detroit, in a Detroit newsroom whose beat was City Hall alone. That meant that they, the person who was covering City Hall was also covering three other beats. That's not a great thing. So now we have this army of residents who are helping us to cover this really big issue that has really critical outcomes for the folks that are sitting there. And I think what's most important about documenters is that you know, the mayor might not care that a journalist is mad at him. A mayor gets really upset when his voters are mad at him. And documenters are the mayor's voters. These are people who live in neighborhoods, who are retired teachers, who are um, college students. We even are about to start a high school program where we train high schoolers to take notes at um, school board meetings. And so this is the outcome. We also run a weekly newsletter, which is a digest of everything people need to know that's happening at the tables of power around the city. I think that's it. So yeah. So that is how we help people stay informed and try to decrease misinformation and disinformation in Detroit. Sorry, there you go. Thanks so much, Candace. Uh, next up is Tassos Morphus. Some slides. Um, I'll skip I think. Skip slides. Um, yep. Yeah. Fantastico. Yep. Yep. Probably this one. Yeah. Yeah, interesting this one, right? Yeah. So hi everyone. My name is Tassos. I'm uh, an ex journalist from Greece. I covered the Greek crisis extensively and now I somehow turned into a media entrepreneur because of mostly need. Um, uh, in order to, to make things work, mostly for local news. Um, so what is, uh, what, is, um, what is Athens Live? Athens Live is basically a non-profit uh, newsroom that's based in Athens, and what we do is that we're trying to, to cover uh, issues that are not covered by the mainstream press, and we do this, we do this mostly in English, I mean exclusively in English. Um, why did we, but, but why did we start? We started Athens Live because um, back in the day, in 2015, uh, there were no independent media outlets based in Athens, based in Greece, who were doing reporting in English for a wider audience. If you can remember back then, the spotlight was in Greece because of the financial crisis and later for the refugee crisis. I mean, this country has been going from one crisis to another, excuse us. But uh, so there's a lot of things to cover. Also, um, trust in the media was very, very low. And uh, also working conditions in the Greek media industry were horrific. Uh, wages were really low. Business models were very old fashioned. So we decided to take matters into our own hands and um, actually start to think. Um, in this diagram, I want you to get the idea of what we tried, or what we tried to do. Um, back then, mainstream press had too many stereotypes. They were reproducing too many stereotypes about Greece. That Greeks are lazy, that Greeks have uh, taken EU money and spent it in various ways, um, that the country needed uh, structural reforms in certain ways, while in fact there were other things that were much more needed. Uh, also, another thing was that, uh, that made us um, do um, what we did was that the media in Greece were too boring. We, 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 we have, we still have a very, very um, established media who do 
uh, the very usual reporting and there is a very vicious circle that's being reproduced on a daily basis. So we tried, we tried to do something that wouldn't take any advertising, would be social first and it would be crowdfunded. Um, and we did, it in, we did that in English because we believe that this is a gap in the market. It was something that would bring back revenue because there were people outside of Greece who, would, uh, who, who are either, who belong either to the diaspora, who are expats, and also, you know, they would pay for such, for such, for such news. Um, so, uh, right, right now, after, after four years, um, I, I like to say that we're uh, a hybrid media company, meaning that we're not a typical newsroom, um, as you probably know it, but we're a hybrid media company doing all sorts of things. In, in my next slides, I'm going to explain to you how, how we function and why I believe we're a hybrid media company. And uh, what's really, what's really uh, making us to go is that we have a community that's not based in Greece, but it's mostly ba based outside of Greece. Our, the, the country that supports us the most, it's Germany. Uh, and they have, also been, uh, they have also been supportive since day one. Um, right now, uh, during the pandemic, we had to leave our office downtown Athens, uh, a really cool place, and uh, we're all working remotely. Um, and um, what's also very important, and I need to mention that, is that we've never ever taken any money from, uh, from, from Greece uh, for our journalism. Uh, of course, we would take money uh, from, from, from Greek foundations and the Greek state in order to keep doing what we're doing. But so far, our funding comes mostly from uh, our from foundations abroad. Um, so to give you some context about our, our journalism, um, what we do is that we have a weekly digest, uh, a newsletter that is um, outlining what happened in Greece uh, during the last, the last week. We have about 3,000 subscribers and 10% is paying for that. Um, we have been part of cross-border collaborations around Europe uh, with uh, Denmark, Germany, uh, Portugal and other countries. Um, another another uh, thing is that because, our, because some of my colleagues are data journalists, they do data sets and they, they, sell, they sell data sets to uh, other other companies, so this is also another source of uh, income for us. Um, we also we also help uh, TV crews, and we offer services to uh, foreign channels in order to do productions and to um, operate in Greece. And uh, the last thing that that we do, and it's really fun because I'm responsible for it, is that we do documentaries. Uh, so we are either producing documentaries for foreign channels or we do our own documentaries. Um, which is probably some of the most interesting things that we've ever done. Um, also, uh, the two other things that we have uh, started since 2019, uh, the one is a pop-up magazine, meaning that we rented a bar, a, 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 a really big, a really big uh, venue, and we had one and a half hour of talks of really cool projects that were happening in Athens. And also then we had a big party and that was, that was really, that was really um, nice and really successful. Um, because also my colleagues, some of my colleagues are photographers. Uh, they're very interested in art and they're also very interested in installations. They have a, a, very, a very big circle of uh, artists in Athens. Uh, we have been pursuing artistic uh, collaborations which that turned into exhibitions and art installations. Uh, and also we had, um, we were registered as a cultural institution in the Greek uh, cultural institution registry. Um, and also another thing is that we partner up with tech companies and uh, local media in Greece, and we do R&D for, for products. Um, so uh, just, just, to, to adjust it to our to our to our uh, topic, um, Greece has been going from one crisis to another. The the the, 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 the major financial crisis started in 2010. Uh, the country was the country was has been suffering since then, uh, and then in 2015 the refugee crisis started. People started arriving in our in Greece's on Greece's islands. 
Um, and then a bit, a bit later, in 2017, the housing crisis started, which means that you can't actually find cheap housing, especially, especially in Athens. Mm -hmm. And just think of how, how these two, th two things don't match. You have, a, you have a financial crisis where wages are so low, like the average wage in Greece, uh, the minimum wage in Greece is about uh, 800 euros. And uh, a room in the center might cost, for one person, might cost around 600 euros. So it's practically not viable. Um, and all these crises, they actually uh, motivated us to bring our own perspective to the, to the, international, to the international dialogue. Uh, with our team, we we're basically working for foreign, for foreign media and um, we were somehow uh, really, really bored with this representation and all the stereotypes. So um, two of the things that we did in order to count, to, to, to battle those stereotypes is to, to, to use as advertising to the, to the international community the slogan, we live here, we know the story, and we're not simply parachuting into Greece and covering and then going back home in our safety in our safety space and also um, we added after some American colleagues told us that they would be that would be very valuable we added on the ground uh, in our value proposition so it's something that we that that we underline every time we we, we um, speak about Athens Live because we write only about stuff that we know if we've, we've been there um, so I want you to watch this video uh, to get an idea of what we're what what we're doing. Much there was an ad uh, back in 2016, uh, and um, it shows how we challenge the stereotypes. I don't know if the stereotypes are misinformation or disinformation. I think there's some uh, somewhere in, in between. Um, but you know, if you ask if you ask people abroad, you, they're, they're going to tell about uh, the, the Greek summer, and uh, we believe that there are so many things that we can we can talk about. Um, uh, and another, yeah. So, the, the, the next video is about, is about um, some debunking that we used to do. Actually, it shows the state of the, of the Greek media. I need, uh, there's a disclaimer that no one was fired the after the misinformation in the Greek media. Koreas. So you get the Gee. idea. Uh, all right. Ανατριχιαστικό το νέο προπαγανδιστικό βίντεο της Βόρειας Κορέας. Chi είναι η ώρα ο Κιμ Γιονκούν συνεχίζει τις απειλές κατά των Ηνωμένων Πολιτειών ενώ αίσθηση προκαλεί ένα νέο βίντεο με πρωταγωνιστά ένα παιδάκι. Είναι μια πολύ ωραία φατσούλα, mm -hmm. μια αθώα γλυκιά φατσούλα η οποία κορίτσι. με όλο αυτό τον τρόπο της απλότητας και της αθώτητας απαγγέλει λόγια μίσους τα οποία είναι φοβερά για να είναι τα βάζεις σε ένα παιδί και, και να το χειροκροτήσεις που τα λέει. Ε, συγκλονίζουν και προκαλούν σοκ. Yankee 
So you get you get the idea of what kind of an environment we're operating in, and like we need to talk about the obvious and state the very very obvious, uh, while in fact our our colleagues are using Hollywood movies in order to actually make money. Um, so uh, again, to, to the crisis that we've been we've been we've been dealing with uh, with. Um, the refugee crisis for us, in order in order to uh, counter uh, misinformation, disinformation around the, the the refugee crisis, we decided to be on the ground. This meant that we had to send people on the ground. Here are some examples of, of our stories. Uh, our photographers and our reporters went on the ground on the islands and covered everything. So we had um, we had original reporting from where things were happening. Um, the other thing is that we covered labor extensively, and uh, we covered. Uh, these are some of the latest uh, stories, um, and we covered labor exactly because they're very, very deep labor. We believe that labor is deeply connected to the crisis um, that I referred to earlier. Uh, and the other crisis, the housing crisis, we thought that it would be a great, uh, a great chance and a great uh, opportunity to do some data journalism, and actually. While we're all feeling uh, in, our, in, our, in our daily lives the impact of the housing crisis, we try to crunch some numbers and see and actually prove that this is, an, this is an, a, a real problem and it's out there. It's not some crazy landlords who ask a tremendous amount of money for some, for some uh, really, bad, really bad place. So we use data journalism in order to cover the, the housing crisis. And um, because it's a pan-European problem, this led to um, cross-border collaborations, and especially this uh, one um, got uh, distinguished at the Sigma Awards. Um, and it's an investigation that um, was uh, conducted uh, in a partnership with many European outlets. Uh, pretty much that's us. Thanks a lot. some time. Yeah, you were perfect. Okay, great. So now I'm going to talk about the green line. Uh, just a reminder that we do have a word cloud. If you guys want to participate and tell us what is one word that defines local journalism in your geographic area, just you know, take a photo of the screen and, <laughs> and enter the URL. It's all lowercase. Thanks. All right. So again, my name is Anita Lee, and I run a hyper-local independent news outlet uh, that's based in Toronto, Canada. That's all about investigating the way we live to help young Torontonians and other underserved communities survive and thrive in a rapidly changing city. Um, I'll show you a quick little video um, that gives you a sense of our aesthetic and our general, a general overview of the Green Line. That's about 20 seconds. You can see that our tagline is redefining Toronto the, through the way we live. And the reason why I, I created that tagline is because I feel that every action that we take as an individual shapes not only who we are as, who we are as people, but our immediate surroundings, our immediate communities, our city, our province, our country. And it really connects to this idea of media as a pillar of democracy. For a long time, you know, we often hear that people are really turned away from news um, or that they passively consume the news and you just feel a sense of anxiety and dread. So I really wanted to connect this idea of action to journalism again because it truly is a public service. So the problem that we're trying to address is that pathways towards a good life or what we consider a successful life have been turned upside down, especially post-pandemic for young people. There's a lot of statistics that show that Gen Zs and millennials, more than older generations are experiencing tons of anxiety, d depression, they're in experiencing a climate crisis, they're experiencing a financial crisis. So a lot of them are having a hard time navigating life post-pandemic. And especially in urban centers, there's a lot of sense of alienation, isolation, just a lot of difficulties. And a lot of folks, especially young and underserved communities in Toronto have been pushed out to the margins. 
So the idea is that the green line is the kind of outlet that I would have loved to have when I was in my 20s that will help you navigate a very rapidly changing city. So by investigating the way we live, we get to the root of the issue that impacts Torontonians the most. And our goal is to collaborate with journalists and creators from the communities that we serve to report on local solutions uh, rather than just exclusively the problems that target the sources of the biggest issues facing our city. And so we have three core verticals plus events. The foundational vertical is lifestyle, but we're not talking about Goop, Gwyneth Paltrow style, 10 candles to spruce up your bathroom. We're really talking about not aspirational lifestyle, but authentic lifestyle. We're talking about mental health issues. We're talking about housing affordability. We're talking about food accessibility. There's also a comedy component. Of course, that's not journalism, but it's part of the engagement funnel that I'm going to be talking to you about in just a moment. We really want to meet people where they are and not look down on the way people consume news. And we're all very, you know, very intersectional. We're very com complex people. Everyone's, you know, has many different interests. So we want to be able to leverage the power of comedy and entertainment to bring people down this uh, funnel of learning and, and knowledge. And finally, there's the news section. So the news section is really a green line take on a major Toronto story of the day. It's either community driven, so straight from the mouths of the community members themselves that where they're telling us here are some gaps in coverage we want you to fill them or it's a take a green line take on a major Toronto story which effectively means anything that serves our audience of young and underserved communities so these are our three core audiences <laughs> for those of you who don't know raccoons kind of the raccoons the official mascot of the city of Toronto um, the first two audiences are our core audiences uh, it's action-oriented young urbanites, which are Gen Zs and millennials in Toronto. They're more diverse than older generations. They're looking for pathways to take action on issues that matter to them. I don't need to tell you guys that some of the biggest social movements of the last decade have been driven by young people, whether it's Me Too or uh, you know, Fridays for Future, whether it's you know, uh, gun control movements in the United States. The second audience is underrepresented Torontonians. So these are people who live, work, and play in highly populated Toronto communities, including my hometown of Scarborough, which is a suburb of almost 700,000 people. Um, it's very under-resourced. I grew up in a working class area where there's a lot of racialized people and new immigrants. And it, you know, the, it's one of the communities that are very overlooked. Um, as well as you know, more affluent communities like Willowdale, but they just don't, because of news deserts, they just don't get reliable coverage. I also include newcomers. There's a lot of new immigrants to Toronto. It's one of the most, most diverse cities in the world. Refugees and dual citizens. So there's many people like myself who are born in Canada, but have parents from other countries. So my parents are from Hong Kong, and we have to navigate these, these identities. And I consider myself very much part of those first two target communities. The last is culture vultures. Some of you may actually belong in this last target audience, which are young English speakers based in urban centers around the world who are interested in Toronto's arts and culture scene. I'm sure you guys have heard a lot about our country and our city in recent years. We've increased in soft power a lot. So a lot of people have taken a keen interest in Toronto news. I won't spend too much time on this, but uh, we soft launched in October 2021 on Instagram and TikTok. And we deliver news tailored to those platforms deliberately because that's where a lot of our audience lives. And we also launched our website, thegreenline.to, in April 2022. We've received universally positive feedback, not only from our industry, but also our target audiences who keep saying, like, we've been waiting for this for so long. Uh, we've been waiting for an outlet like this. And 85% of our audience is made up of Gen Zs and millennials. Uh, we also have a really high average engagement rate of around 14% on Instagram, which is much higher than the average 1%. Uh, we also have a ton of partnerships, which is, are really critical to our success, whether it's media partners or grassroots partners are really significant. Grassroots partners like BCG Scarborough, Trustee Hub, Food Share, they all are very value aligned and they provide us with connections to communi our communities on the ground. Um, and I also collaborate with uh, uh, university institutions as well. So this is the probably the most essential part of our model, which I'm quite proud of. There's the attention funnel and then the action journey, which I'll talk about in just a moment. So this is a form of an engagement strategy where we meet people where they are. At the very top of the funnel, we have comedy, opinion pieces, and behind the scenes coverage, which is tailored to TikTok. Then the next level is service journalism, which is basically profiles of community organizations and individuals, um, as well as uh, how-to guides. So for example, we have a guide to co-housing in the city, and that's tailored to Instagram. 
Then we have original journalism, which is essentially what you might find in a newspaper, but it's tailored to Instagram, you know, very adapted to its visual format. And then at the very bottom of the funnel, we have in-depth journalism, which is our long-form solutions-oriented uh, features that unpack uh, just issues in, a, in an engaging and solutions-oriented way. So uh, I'll give you an example of these. On the left-hand side is a TikTok where our Donish, uh, Donish Anwar, who's our comedian, is you know, making fun of you know, just this idea of co-living uh, among millennials and Gen Zs. Um, and then it's a very engaging kind of funny TikTok. Then if somebody's interested in going deeper, they might look at our guide to co-housing in the city, which basically effectively teaches young people how to find co-housing and how to buy houses uh, with groups of like five people or more, given that housing affordability is a major issue, issue in Toronto. Then the next level is, this is an example of a story that we did because there was a really viral go story going around in major Toronto outlets that, that basically said that nobody can afford a house that's under a million dollars in the city anymore, which is ridiculous. So we, we've heard this story time and time again. So we, my team and I were like, what can we do that actually provides value to our audience? So we created a story that's, you know, the headline says it all. We already know buying a detached house in Toronto is really hard to do, but is that still the goal for young city dwellers? And then the right-hand side is, is a story that has not yet come out, but it's the long-form piece that we would do um, that really kind of brings people down this funnel of understanding and knowledge. So if they're interested, they can go deeper and deeper, which is what our hope is. This is our action journey. It's an original theory of change model um, and also a core part of our, of our editorial model and business model. So in a given month, we tackle a systemic issue and we have four activations. In the first week, we publish an explainer that unpacks the systemic problem explored in our long-form feature. In week two, we publish a long-form feature that is solutions-oriented and interactive. Week three, we have an event that convenes the reporter, uh, sources from the story, as well as community members to gather to discuss the feature and possible solutions to the problem. And then week four is my favorite, actually. We publish an article that actually covers the event that then crowdsources the solutions from the community members and reflects it back to them so they can take action on those issues. This is, we are not an advocacy organization. It's not being prescriptive. We're just literally reporting the solutions that come from the community members because they know their communities better than us. And we also take those solutions and it informs our ongoing editorial coverage. So it's this cyclical thing that happens where we're not just one and done, where we're just reporting on a story and moving on. That's really important to us. And so uh, an example of this, on the left-hand side, we recently did a piece on COVID reentry in the city. Um, the explainer kind of unpacks Toronto in two pandemics, comparing, kind of looking at solutions during the 1918 Spanish flu in the city and how we can learn those lessons in a modern context for the coronavirus. On the right-hand side, we have a long-form feature. All of this is on our website, by the way, that is called Living with COVID in Toronto, when you feel alone, even though we're all in this together. And that goes more in depth into the issue. Then on the left-hand side, you have the event. So we have our reporter, Stephen Zhao, on the left-hand side. We have a bunch of sources that were featured in the story, as well as leaders um, nationally, as well as municipally, who will talk about the issue. And this is the event's called Learning to Breathe Again, How to Live with COVID and P Compassion in Toronto. So this is where we're gonna surface solutions. And on the right-hand side, you can see how the solutions are curated in a drop-down menu um, so that people can always go back and take action on issues that they care about. So uh, another problem that we're addressing is that the reason why we're solutions oriented, like I said, is that people feel a sense of dread and anxiety when they read the news. It's not uncommon for me to talk to people my age and have them say, I'm really like, I avoid the news altogether. And that is concerning because people need to consume the news to be active participants in our democracy. So the idea is that we want to address these issues, these stats, and basically help young people and underserved communities really engage in the democratic process through this action journey. And our hope is that we redefine the city's identity by centering the people and the places that are the driving force behind Toronto's sense of culture and identity, which are the people who have actually been pushed to the margins. And I also want to emphasize that local news is the first point of defense against misinformation. So a lot of misinformation can, the same kind of misinformation kind of impacts and infects many different countries around the world. But if we're on the ground doing the reporting, we can actually support national and international outlets in navigating these kinds of, um, this, this false information. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through elements of the website and what our hypothetical event would look like. But effectively, that's it. It's a modern Canadian outlet and call to action, and I'm hoping to re-envision the way journalism is done um, so that people can become more involved. 
Uh, thank you so much. This is the website, uh, my the social handles, and if you want to reach out, you can reach out to me at hello at the Um And yeah, and I just want to emphasize again that uh, there's a QR code and all the sheets in your seats. You can also visit the link up here. And really what we're asking for you to do, especially if you're in local news, is that we want to form an international network of local news organizations on the ground. There's a lot of tips that I hope you guys took away from this panel today. Um, and we just want to collaborate. I think it's, it, we're stronger together. So uh, yes, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we're not allowed to take questions inside, but if you'd like, we're more than happy to answer questions uh, outside of the, the venue. Um, but thank you so much for listening and thank you for being present.